So last class I said we would be looking at Milton's uh, poem, Paradise Lost. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that it was an epic, uh, but I know that, and some of you who were with me last semester are, are acquainted with the epic because we did four of them in total. Uh, we looked at the Odyssey, we looked at Virgil's Aeneid, we looked at actually five. We did briefly Ovid, Ovid's Metamorphosis, although we just talked about the beginning of it, just to compare it to Genesis, how the creation accounts uh, differ and are similar for that matter in some ways. Uh, we looked at Dante's Divine Comedy, and then we looked at the Anglo-Saxon uh, epic Beowulf, which is a little different than the others because it doesn't follow the Greco-Roman uh, conventions. But it struck me I should say some of the things that uh, or summarize what I said last semester, even for those of you who were here. Um, some of the things that I lecture upon um, are not it's not that you didn't hear them, it's that you didn't see the importance of, because it seems sort of peripheral. Uh, the conventions of the epic are significant in terms of identifying the features just from a literary perspective. Uh, when we read stories, we tend to be trying to derive the meaning, like what's going on in the story? Like who are the main characters? How does the plot work? Um, and, and so forth. And, and Basically, we're trying to get that out of it. But from a literary perspective, we're trying to look at the devices that are used to create the meaning and the form and the content go together. And the one, uh, in fact, I'm going to say from a literary perspective, the form is what allows the content to be powerful. And it's even part of the content. And that's particularly the case with poetry. Most people don't read poetry these days. Um, they read blog posts. Uh, they read, maybe if they're interested in fiction, they might read long novels. Uh, novels are, can be artistic, but they're not, the form of the novel is in general uh, less sophisticated and certainly less conspicuously um, artistic than a poem is. The poem, it jumps out at you, particularly if it's an older poem in which we find a, a meter, a regular beat in the poem and things like rhyme and other literary devices. Well, one of the poem types of poetry that we looked at is the epic last semester. And the reason for that is actually down in the, I, I've listed them here in advance because my, my leash is a bit short here and I didn't want to yank this all down, but also just to save me a bit of time, is in the seventh point. This is the reason that I'm looking at an epic uh, in a, intro to literature class. Even though there are all sorts of different types of writing, I'm, I'm, I've placed a great deal of emphasis on the epic because the, an epic is an encyclopedic poem. You can't read it. You can come forward if you can. I can't. No, no, any of you. I, I don't know if you can read it or not uh, down so low. Um, it's encyclopedic. What's an encyclopedia? Encyclopedia is, you'll, it's just a, a, a compository of books uh, intended for children. And it contains all the information. And we, we post 18th century, we alphabetize it, A to Z. And there'll be entries under it. You'll maybe see a picture. There'll be a little write-up. And it'll explain what's in there. And an encyclopedia is really everything that you could know uh, and presented at the audience at, at a basic level. It's not meant to be exhaustive or anything like that. That's what encyclopedia is. Within the word encyclopedia is that word paideia. And, it's an, and the paideia is in reference to children. A, a child in Greek is pais, a child. And, uh, and the encyclo is everything around that, around childhood. So it's to uh, educate. Uh, children so that they understand the world around them. It's, it, for us, it's just a form of knowledge. That's what an encyclopedia is. It's just a list. It's just information. In the epic tradition, encyclopedia contains far more than what we have reduced uh, knowledge to be, which is we've reduced it to be information and, and just that. But the moral component and the component of learning how to live in other words, wisdom is, in part, is a part of the epic encyclopedic tradition. 
and the purpose of it is paideia. Now, what, why do I mention that and why is that significant to us? Well, because in uh, Ephesians 6 verse 4, Paul uh, says that uh, parents should educate their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. One of the words there for that is paideia. Admonition there is actually, it's not as it, it's a, it's a bad translation. Um, Paideia and nuthesia, fear and admonition. It's a strange translation, let me tell you. It's, got, it's not even close to the original sense. There's an interpretation going on there. Um, but it's to bring children up in the fear of the Lord. That's why the fear is put there, and that's the right way to educate. Um, but Paul is intensely interested in the uh, path of education. It's central to the biblical uh, witness as well. So in, in uh, Deuteronomy 6 as well, um, Moses uh, uh, says that we should hear, O Israel, it's called the Shema, Shema, O Israel, you are to love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You heard that before? Who says it in your recognition? It's probably not Moses. Who says that? that phrase. And in what context? Sure. Jesus. Yes. Yes, Jesus. And in response to what question? What's well, the greatest commandment? And he cites Deuteronomy where Moses is talking to Israel about teaching because he then goes on to say, and you are to teach these things to your children and you're to write them uh, on your foreheads, on your arms on the doors of your homes and on the gates of the city. In other words, it's to govern your thoughts, your actions, your domestic sphere, and the public square. And that is uh, part of the paideia of God. It's to teach in that context, but it's also to live rightly. Now, the encyclopedic epic does the same thing. I'm not saying that it is uh, equivalent, but I'm saying it's trying to do the exact same sort of thing. It's particularly intended towards how to understand the world and how to live it. And in what sense does it cover those things? Well, it, it has certain conventions. Uh, I'll, I'll skip the first one here and the second one. It talks in the third one about the Council of the Gods. It teaches us about the nature of the gods. This is not just any old story. Most narratives don't do this. As I say, an, an epic is a long narrative heroic poem. But most heroic poems these days don't deal with the gods, the nature of the gods, and how they relate to us. But epics do. They begin that way. <coughs> They're written in ep with epic diction. So in this case, uh, it's written in a style that is an exalted style. It's a grand style. Conspicuously grand. So if you find you're reading Milton, you find this is really hard to read. It's written in very literary language, well, that's intentional on his part. He could have done otherwise, but he wants it to have a, a weightiness to it, a, a greatness about it. And he'll use epic similes and so forth. I'll, I'll show those to you when we come upon them. It will also contain a descent into the underworld. So it won't only talk about the gods above, but also what happens below. In other words, uh, the underworld is the realm of the dead. And as I say, it's encyclopedia, it will contain everything. It'll, talk, it'll give us an account of human history. We'll find that in Paradise Lost. I don't think we're going to look at it in this class, but in Paradise Lost 11 and 12, it will give an account of human history from the beginning, which is where this whole epic begins in Paradise, all the way to the present day. <coughs> and going forward to the second coming of Christ. It will give the whole account of human history. Well, we got that in the underworld in Homer and Virgil. All of that was given. It was on the, uh, uh, so say to Virgil's uh, or to Aeneas, he was given an account of what would happen after he founded Rome, what Rome would go on to do. So it was looking prospectively towards the future. So it was not only telling us about the gods, about the nature of, of good and evil, uh, what's happening to the dead afterwards, but also the whole trajectory of human history. So it's telling us everything about everything. Not many, not many 
forms of literature do this, but an epic does. And we're going to look now at Milton's account, which is a, a Christian take on this. So the pagans had a certain view of this, the pagan Greeks, the pagan Romans. What's the Christian view of the nature of the gods? What's the Christian view of the nature of heroism? <coughs> What's the Christian form of the understanding of what happens in death? And what's the Christian notion of paideia? All those things are going to be brought into focus here. And we're going to see that we can compare and contrast the Greek and the Roman understanding of these things with the Christian understanding of these things. And that's, that comparison is explicit. But in order to make the comparison, Milton does what I think is entirely sensible to do and is the traditional way of approaching it, which is to use the, uh, let's say, the flagpole that's already been set up by his foregoers and to, to run up his own flag up the flagpole. So when I say that Milton, if I say that Milton's Paradise Lost is the greatest poem ever written, um, I could just be expressing my feelings about it, but uh, you might say, so what? I don't feel that way myself, and I don't... <laughs> I, think, I don't think it is the greatest. I will be able to say, and it doesn't mean I'm going to persuade you, but I'm going to be able to say, yes, but compare Milton to his, uh, the other candidates for the greatest poem ever written. And how will we compare it? Well, we'll look at how they use the exact same devices and the same methodologies, etc., and see which one is greater. And we'll be able to compare them side by side. This, is hap this happens today in, uh, in all manners of uh, life, usually in sports and so forth. Who is the, the, the goat, the greatest of all time, that sort of stuff, right? Music, whatever. Well, how do you do that? Well, you compare like with like, and you set them alongside one another, and you'll look at statistics and stuff like that. I'm not interested in statistics here. I don't think that's a, actually a good way to compare people. And I, I find in those athletic comparisons, they're always talking about athletes from different eras and looking at their points totals or number of yards or who knows what. And you'll say, but the game is very different now than it was then. And I saw that guy play and I saw that guy play and that guy who played whose stats aren't as good as better than that guy. And you'll say, okay, whatever. So it's all qualitative then. Yes, and this is, but this is the objective form of a qualitative observation. We can look at how they follow certain conventions and these are the epic conventions. And we can talk about them as a literary, literary features. And every successive poet who wants to say this poem deserves to be compared to the great poems of the past will follow the conventions, even if they're going to try and outdo the foregoing epics. But you can't outdo them if you don't follow in their footsteps. So there is a certain um, course of action that every generation follows. And this is why you go, to, this is what education is about. Education doesn't begin from ground zero each generation. It builds on what came before it. I'm speaking the English language. It's a, uh, an inheritance which is rich and deep and long. And uh, I didn't invent the language. I don't even invent many words. Uh, and if I did, you wouldn't know what I meant by them until they started to be used and then they become uh, you know, fashionable for a little while and then people forget it and think, well, that was sort of, yeah, it was trendy at the time and oh yeah, that sounds really stupid now. Like the word cool. I don't know if cool is cool anymore. What's the cool word for cool now? Is it anything? No? I don't even know. I'm too uncool to know what's cool, so I, I don't even try to do that. After a while, when you get old enough, you realize that the worst the least cool thing you can do is to try to be cool when you're old. Just, you know, give up on that. And so I have. <coughs> so those are the epic features uh, in general. Now we're going to see how they apply in Milton's Paradise Lost. So let me put this up on the screen here and I'll have to push this out of the way. Try not to bring the whole house down here. So it worked. So as I said, the 
uh, one of the epic conventions, the first one on the whiteboard there, was that it begins with invoking a muse. Now, what is a muse? The muses, there were nine of them in classical Greek and Latin poetry. They were the goddesses of memory, or they were born from their mother, who is memory. That was her name. And they were her children. And the nine children were associated with particular arts. There was an epic muse. There was a muse for history, Cleo. There was, an ep there was a muse for lyrical poetry. There's a muse for history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's all different types of muses. There's one specifically uh, dedicated to the epic poem, however. And this is the one that M Milton will uh, invoke. Now, when he does so, Milton, being a Christian, could be accused of paganism. Oh. I need to backtrack a little bit. I, was, I didn't finish a thought, which is that uh, Milton is following the footstep of, of foregoing poets, but he could have said, what does a Christian have to do with paganism at all? Why am I bothering following pagan conventions? Christianity is true. It's, 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 it's the true revelation of who God is, and all other revelations of the gods are nothing but idolatry. It's, why would I even bother with it? What does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Let's just, let's, let's start all over again. <clears throat> As I say, he could have done that, and you, you could have said that's a legitimate path to, to, uh, to follow, but all I can say is that you would lose a great deal of the force of persuasion in, in Christian teaching if you ignored all of the cultures of the world around you. You couldn't say, look how much greater the gospel is than your teaching about the gods. Look how much more loving God is in the Christian understanding than the gods of this world. If you didn't even bother with the comparison, I'm not even going to use any forms of comparison. As I say, you could do that because you would say all of these are idols. They're nothing. The gods of this world are not gods at all. People worship them, but there's nothing there. But that's not what Milton does, and that's never what people uh, who uh, have gone out as missionaries to the world have done either. They have uh, spoken to people in the terms of the culture in which they're living and, and made the comparison so that they can understand. Now, this is the thing about Christianity. It is a rational faith. It's a, it's a persuasive means. Conversion is not beating people into submission. It's, it's drawing them, helping them to understand. It's part of the paideia. It's, it's, it's showing them, teaching them. And you do that by comparison. So you talk about Gitche Manitou. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. Jesus is God the Son. And let me talk to you, and we'll, but I'll do it in comparison with terms of gods in which you already understand. This is what happened in the Greco-Roman world, and it, mo it moved into, let's say, the Germanic world, into uh, every country of the earth now. And so there, it was used comparatively. Anyway, so, <coughs> sorry, going back to this. So he begins with an invocation of a muse, but he also begins with his theme, his great theme here. Because I said to you, as I think it was point eight, that each epic writer seeks to compare himself to the foregoing epic writers, but also to outdo them. To outdo them. Well, what were the Greek and Roman epics? For those of you who didn't do them here, um, what was the main theme? Well, in the Iliad, the first great epic, it was the rage of Achilles, the very first line. The word, first word was wrath, the wrath of Achilles. That was what the whole of the epic was about. And then the question was, why is he angry? And he was angry because he was sh being shown disrespect by Agamemnon. And uh, he said, I deserve the utmost of respect. I need to be treated as the greatest among the Greeks, and you're not treating me so. So it's about Achilles' sense of greatness and his and his pride, in other words. Uh, the Odyssey by Homer is about a man by the name of Odysseus who is wise. 
It was about the wisdom of, of Odysseus. In both cases, they're just Greek princes dealing with individuals. The Roman epic goes a bit further than that because that's just for the Greek world that uh, Achilles and Odysseus are considered great. Um, although Alexander the Great slept with a copy of the Iliad under his bed when he went and conquered the whole known world. So it, it's not that it had no influence. It, it was part of his paideia to look up to Achilles and to want to be like Achilles. And he became Alexander the Great. But Aeneas, in Virgil's rendition, uh, he be, the, Virgil begins his poem, Of arms and of a man I sing. A reference to the war of uh, Troy and of the man Odysseus. So the two epics of Homer are being compared to the one epic of Virgil and he's saying my man, my man is greater. And why? Because the Roman Empire is far greater than the Greeks. He is, this, this hero is going to go, go on to found Rome, which is the greatest city of its time. In fact, there's a whole empire. It, it, it encompasses the whole known world. And here's the beginning of that. So it's not just an ancient historical epic, it's related to the present, here and now, and it will be an empire which will, um, we're living in a golden age, says Virgil. So it's a greater epic, says he. <coughs> I'll skip over the other epics, let's just come to this one. Here's Milton's theme of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree which brought death into our world and all our woe with loss of Eden till one greater man restore it and regain the blissful seat. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai. Okay, sing heavenly muse. So is he referring to the muses of, the, of memory, the pagan muses? No, it's the heavenly muse. Well, and there's only one. And in this case, we probably say it's the Holy Spirit. Well, why would we say that? Because he makes repeated references to inspiration. He refers to Oreb, Mount Oreb or Mount Sinai, didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed. Who is that? Well, that's Moses. He's appealing to the same spirit that taught Moses to write down the, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch or a, ref a reference to Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God. Again, references to the Holy Spirit. Milton is invoking the Holy Spirit as his God, as his divine muse, to tell this story. So even in the invocation of his muse, he's outdoing the foregoing epics, because this is a grand theme by God himself, not one of the nine muses dedicated to memory, but the God of gods, who is always taught. But note, he mentions two men here. This is very interesting. Of man's first disobedience, till one greater man restore us. Who are these men? Yes. Yes, very good. So man's first disobedience, that will be Jesus, or Adam. Not Jesus. That would be a problem. <laughs> and yet he will also include a second man, or as uh, it says in Paul's epistles, a second Adam. And he will restore what was lost. Now, this, the epic here is called Paradise Lost, but it will include within it not only how paradise was lost, but how it will in future be restored. That's not the subject matter of this poem but it's being, it will be brought to our attention at the end of the poem. It's not all lost. There, here's what's going to happen in the future to redeem what you, Adam, have lost. Your, one of your seed will regain what all you lost and re will restore paradise to you. But note how it begins, and note the style. It long sentences. I, I said you should read it aloud, and this is the reason because it, it, if you don't read it aloud, it's easy to get lost in the, in the long uh, uh, clauses and the lengthy syntax, which is often uh, twisting and turning and so forth. Uh, but there he wants us, and he announces his subject matter. He's going to describe 
the loss of Eden and its restoration and us to sing of these. Or if it's not going to the height of the mountain where we first, where God reveals himself to Moses and gives him the Ten Commandments and also reveals to him the account of his, human history from its early beginnings, rites in Genesis. Remember, this is the, these are the books of Moses. Moses wasn't there for this. It's been revealed to him. Here's what happened. Here's how creation began, etc. Or if you don't want to talk about it in terms of the, the mountain top, let's talk about it as a little brook. Siloah's brook. The water that symbolizes the Holy Spirit in a very, like it's trickling beneath your feet. It's not up on the mountain where you're terrified. It's down here. But Milton invokes thy aid. Thy is a reference, uh, a personal reference to God here. I invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that, and here's the, again the attempt to outdo, with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian amount, above the Greek mountain, far above. while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost <clears throat> prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure. Oh, I didn't even want to use this one. Okay, I want to use this one. Instruct me, for thou knowest thou from the first was present, and with mighty wings outspread dove-like sats brooding, on the vast abyss and made it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to man. Now, no poet has ever claimed to, or even tried to do what Milton's trying to do here. Dante did not try to do it in his Divine Comedy. There is no claim to uh, call upon the Holy Spirit like this at the outset and to recount these things and to outdo the foregoing epics. It was, not, it was never so explicit. Milton is very bold. Uh, others will be very critical of Mr. Milton for what he will eventually do, which is depict God himself speaking. That does, Dante does not do that. He gets it at the end of the Divine Comedy, there's a vision of the Trinity which he can barely uh, comprehend. He can't even look at it. It's so glorious. So there's an element of humility. That's not here in Milton. Milton is, is saying, here's how God has revealed himself. So I will be bold. If he has said, this is the way I am to be understood, I will not say I'm being humble by denying that I've seen this. I will, I will lean on the revelation and say that it is so. But note that he is going to do things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, to assert eternal providence, eternal providence. So it's gonna comprehend all of human history. Is it greater than the epics before? Well, of course it is, because it's not confined to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, which in Milton's day is now no longer an empire. And he has one final feature of it, which is an interesting one here, there's a recognition, despite the boldness of his attempt, that he is not only unable to articulate it on his own, but his own person is darkened by what we Christians will call sin. He has a, a, a moral problem, a spiritual problem, which is that he's a sinner. That's not the epics of the pagan world don't even acknowledge the category of sin as, as such. They understand moral transgression and so forth. They, they do that, but they, they, they're not going to acknowledge that they are morally incapable of telling the tale while telling the tale. So Milton needs God to be able to tell about God. So this is a real appeal, it's, and, and, and you can only see that by comparison with the foregoing epics, how different this is, how comparable it is, but also how different it is. So this uh, beginning here is, is, is often called the prolegomena 
or just the uh, invocation of the muse. By the way, there's going to be four of them in Paradise Lost. There's one here, there's another one in book three, which will be the place where we will go down to the underworld, which in Milton's understanding is actually not the underworld. <laughs> He's going to go to heaven in book three. When he goes to see God and describe the courts of God, he will invoke the muse again. He'll do it in book seven. He'll also do it in book nine. He'll do it in book seven when he's going to describe the, he the heavens as in the, uh, the, the stars, astronomy. And he'll do it again in book nine. We'll see this in a couple of classes when he talks about the fall of mankind. So four times he invokes the muse. And he does it with slightly different language. But I'll, I'll look at those as we do it as well. Any comments or questions about this thus far? I spent a fair bit of time on the beginning here and thrown a fair bit at you. Yes? Were you never putting or almost comparing yourself on a certain state of like dawn versus dreams in Revelation? Yes. In what sense do you mean that though? Well, I mean, if dawn is like, his, the, his revelation was the one that ended up in the Bible and stuff like that. But is he saying that this is almost the next one that he sees? Or? No, he's not trying to add to Revelation. I mean, at, at the end of John's uh, revelation, it says that no man, <laughs> if anyone who seeks to add to this, it will be anathema, right? There's a, he's not going to add to revelation. He is going to take what is a revelation and put it in the clothes of the pagan epic. And he's going to show the man that is in these clothes is like the Hulk. He pops the clothes apart. This is a man that can't be constrained by the clothes of Bruce Banner. That's sort of what's going on here, right? So here's the man, and let me show you what becomes of the man when the Christian story comes in it. And, and what I've said there is inappropriate in the sense that his notion of heroism is gonna be the exact opposite of worldly heroism. The, the uh, understanding of worldly heroism, we're about to meet him in, in book one. His name is Satan the proud Satan, the indomitable Satan, the man who, or, or the being who will not bow to anyone, who's gonna be the greatest, he's gonna beat his chest, like Achilles. He will be angry and he will be proud and he will bow to no one. That's not Milton's heroism. So he's, gonna, he's also going to completely reforge the understanding of heroism when he comes to give his Christian paideia to us. And again, we see this by looking at the pagan epic and how it develops and then take the Christian epic and alongside of it. By the way, when the, I say the pagan epic, that's the Greco-Roman one, but I would say it's the world's epic like that. The idea of human greatness, a great man leading his country, that's in every country of the world. Not just the Greco-Roman, to our day. Think of the pop stars, the athletes, whatever, these are the heroes. You know what, it's not just that they're athletically gifted, it's they have an indomitable spirit. They get up when they get knocked down and they will not stop. They're relentless, we admire their spirit. That's what makes them great. Milton's heroism is going to be far greater than that. How? Well, he's gonna talk about it at the end of the epic. His hero will be humble and he will bear the sins of the world, the sins that he did not have for a people that he loved, but that did not deserve him. It's a totally different way of understanding heroism. It's not the sly, lying Odysseus. It's not the proud, indomitable Achilles. It's the humble shepherd born of a virgin in a backwater of Jerusalem, right? right, Or on the outskirts of Jerusalem in Bethlehem, born in a manger. That's gonna be his hero. Okay, who's the anti-hero then? Well, let's come and meet him now. Say first, says Milton, now he's speaking to the muse or the Holy Spirit, say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell, Say first what cause moved our grandparents in that happy state, favored of heaven so highly, to fall off from their creator and transgress his will 
for one restraint, lords of the earth, the world besides, who first seduced them to that foul revolt? Answers his own question, the infernal serpent. He it was whose guile stirred up with envy and revenge deceived the mother of mankind what time his pride had cast him out from heaven and all his host of rebel angels by whose aid aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers. He trusted to have equaled the Most High if he opposed, and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God raised in pious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. So how did it happen and who did it? Who brought this all about? Satan. And when did it begin? It actually did not begin in the Garden of Eden. It began before that. So Milton is going to give us a count which predates what we read in Genesis, but is mentioned in Scripture. There's a, there was a war in heaven, and Satan and the rebel angels were thrown down, a third of them from the courts of God. They rebelled against him. Satan was once Lucifer. He was, the, he was the bearer of light. He was one of the angels of God. He sought to be on par with God, to be a God like God's. And he, for his sin, and sin, we're going to come to the origins of sin, he was cast down. That's who, and he's going to go backtrack and show us what began before the beginning. There's a supernatural element to human life. There's a, a war amongst the gods, if you will or uh, in this case, between God and the one who pretended he could be God. It was him. And what happened? So we'll, we'll give the account. Now, he's going to begin this, unlike the foregoing epics, he's going to begin it in hell. Having begun with the invocation, he says, well, how did this fall from paradise happen? It happened because of Satan. Well, now that I've mentioned him, let's look at him. For which reason, some people later, and I say, so he brings uh, the underworld right to the front of the epic, and usually it doesn't come till much later. So in, in uh, the Odyssey, I, I believe it's in book 11, um, Odysseus goes down to the underworld to find uh, information about his uh, his father and and how to get home and all that sort of stuff in the uh, Aeneid Aeneas goes down to the underworld in book six. He goes down a Trojan. He comes up a Roman Very different character, but note it's in the middle of the book Milton pulls it to the front of the book and so for some people they have suggested that Milton's hero is actually Satan because we're going to be introduced to this grand character of Satan at the beginning, and he has terrifically powerful and persuasive speeches. And uh, so one romantic author, uh, William Blake, says that Milton uh, was of the devil's party without knowing it. He was too successful. In fact, he's going to say that uh, his Satan is more uh, admirable than his God is. We'll come back to that when we look at Milton's God uh, next time. But he raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. The attempt failed. Uh, him, the almighty power, hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he and his horrid crew lay vanquished. So now they're on the floor of hell. If you could call it a floor, because it's not a floor, it's a lake of fire. Rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal, but his doom, that is Satan's doom, reserved him to more wrath. For now, the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Here's Satan's problem. He has not only left the place of utmost joy beholding God to a place where he not only does not see God, 
but he remembers what he's lost in seeing God, and he's, he's sur surrounded by everlasting pain. Will he, will he recant? Will he seek to uh, call for forgiveness? He will not. For all of the things that he has lost, for all of the pain that he suffers, he will not relent. And so we'll come to a speech in that, but he looks around. He throws his baleful eyes that witness huge affliction and dismay mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once, as far as angels can, he views the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon horrible on all sides round as one great furnace flamed. Yet from those flames, no light, but rather darkness visible served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges and a fiery deluge fed with ever-burning sulfur unconsumed. Such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious. Here their prison ordained in utter darkness and their portion set as far removed from God and light of heaven as from the center thrice to the utmost pole. I will come back to that in a second, but note these uh, things. Note the comparison between darkness and light, first of all. God's presence is associated with light. Jesus is the light of the world. God is pre presented as, uh, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God is presented as light. His word is presented as light, not only be because it, it illumines us, but because it shows us which way we should walk, right? But God is associated with light. What is hell associated with then? Darkness. Because God is not present in hell. He is removed from hell. In some sense, hell is, dis is characterized by being removed from everything that is good, which God is. Now, Milton's problem here is that how can he describe what he's going to describe in, in hell if there's no light there because you need light in order to see. You could just have Satan hearing terrible, scary noises like, you know, when you're in your bedroom and you're having nightmares and there, it's total pitch darkness and you hear things and you're terrified. But he could have done that. He in, instead uses a bit of a paradox. He calls it darkness visible. There's, it's, it's, it's metaphysically and physically impossible. B darkness is not visible. You need the light to see it. But he no longer has God. And so he, he can't see. He's blind, literally. But he describes the uh, landscape of hell and it's painful to him. What he, Milton is doing is using the Augustinian notion of, of good and evil. God is good, evil is the absence of good. God is associated with light, hell is associated with the absence of light. It's the privation of the good. It's a way, it's a, an orthodox way of describing evil. And it's necessary to hold on to the orthodoxy here because otherwise we will be, fall into the trap and misunderstanding that the romantics did of seeing uh, Satan as a sort of, um, competitor to God, in which case you fall into the problem of, uh, of dualism and Manichaeism for, for that matter. There's, there's, a, there's a good power and there's an evil power and they're opposite to one another and there's the fight between good and evil and it's, it, it's two equal and opposite powers vying for supremacy here. That's not Milton's account. Milton's account is that God is supreme and there is only one God and Satan is his creature and he is also his slave. He's his drudge. He's going to serve God's purposes. That's Christian teaching. Again, the, the Romantics don't understand this or they misrepresent it in part because they have departed from Christian orthodoxy on this and they misread the text. But it's quite clear uh, if you read Milton's words that Milton calls one God and the other is just simply not. He claims to be God simply because, again, as a spiritual being, he has been created and his, 
he's not going to be destroyed by virtue of the fact that he's been thrown down to hell. So in that sense, he has et eternal existence, but that's only been granted to him by God. So there's no comparison there. But he is the adversary. He is Satan. Satan means adversary in Hebrew. He will set him up. So, but he sees this, and he sees what? How unlike the place from whence they fell. There the companions of his fall, overwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire, he soon discerns, and weltering by his side, one next himself in power, and next in crime, long after known in Palestine, and named Beelzebub. Milton is going to name here in book one a whole series of uh, gods recognized in the ancient world in, in uh, the Old Testament. He'll talk about Baal. He'll talk about Moloch. Right? These will be gods that are recognized in ancient and worshipped as gods. Um, Milton is following the, the church fathers in understanding these gods as demons in disguise. They have deceived men to uh, lead them to think that these are gods, and they will follow the gods' bidding to appease the gods. And that will include the Greek and Roman gods, for that matter, Zeus and, and so forth. But those are not the ones mentioned in Scripture. The ones mentioned in Scripture are the Canaanite gods, like Moloch. Moloch, who, who demanded child sacrifice to appease him. Put the baby on the scalding hands of the, of the idol. Like, they, they heat a metal... Uh, idol with his hands out till he's burning hot and then you put your ba your newborn baby on that and it f fries up that's Moloch worship part of the uh, worship of that horrid God which even the Israelites did in Gehenna the valley of Hinnom you know Gehenna have you, where's that what that word of Gehenna have you heard that word before it's what Jesus describes hell as. He, he uses the word Gehenna. It's where the city garbage dump was located outside Jerusalem. And there's a fire burning in the, in the garbage dump to burn the garbage. But they also, that's where they set the, uh, this metal statue of Moloch and burnt their own babies at one point. That's how horrible. So Jesus describes the garbage dump where the fires are always burning, the trash is always going up in a horrid smell with the idolatry that happened there as well. That's what hell is like, where your babies are sacrificed to a god who is a demon. He describes that as hell. Some biblical scholars say, well, Jesus was not talking about what we call hell. He was just talking about the garbage dump. What happened in the garbage dump? Moloch worship. He's identifying a, a feature of human cultures that have gone demonic, that they sacrifice their babies. He says, that's like that. Hell is like that, where, the, where your future, because if you think about your, your future, it's in your offspring. Human beings are going to die. If you want a future, you will have children. You'll be fruitful and multiply and fill and subdue the earth. You'll teach your children to love the Lord your God. I don't think you can burn them up if you are going to do that. Anyway, um, Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, one of the demons worshipped there, but here presented as a fallen angel. And they will get into a conversation here. I'm gonna, we'll look at some of the speeches that Satan presents here because they're just terrific here. And this is Lucifer, or one who, Lucifer means the light bearer, Pharaoh is to bear, and Luce is light in, in Latin. And he's going to look at Beelzebub and say, man, you look bad. <laughs> you know, the last time I saw you, you looked really good, and now, you, boy, you, uh, you've fallen on hard times. Of course, he doesn't realize how bad he looks. But never mind, if thou beest he, but oh, how fallen, how changed from him, who in the happy realms of light, clothed with transcendent brightness, didst outshine myriads, though bright. If he whom mutual league united thoughts and counsels, equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise, joined with me once, now misery hath joined in equal ruin, into what pit thou seest from what height fallen, so much the stronger proved he with his thunder. 
And till then, who knew the force of those dire arms? So what is he, what is he saying? He's saying, you were with me in the beginning when we rebelled against God. And uh, we've been catastrophically defeated. But how could we have known? Because he was God and you weren't? <laughs> Maybe. Because he was almighty and you weren't? Yeah, Maybe. You know, how did we know that we're going to get beaten down against the almighty God who created us until we fought against him? Well, I think that's pretty... So what you will find here among Satan's speeches, uh, the reason I mention this is not to just uh, point out the irony and humor there, but the sense in which Satan's logic uh, always flatters himself and always distorts reality. Satan is the father of lies. He always lies. And part of his lies, he believes his own lies. He lives in unreality. That's what happens when you lie. And when you live in unreality by lying, you can't see your way to the truth, which is why you need revelation. You can't reason your way up to God. Although reason has a, a, a functional capacity to help you to do that, it's, it, reasoning is also perverted by the fall. People cannot come to the conclusion that God exists on their own. They can dimly apprehend it or him. And they do do that in the sense that they recognize that there are gods and that there's a divine order of things and there's a hierarchy and a principle and there's good and evil and so forth. That You can see that, but you can't see who the good one actually is. That needs to be revealed to you. The Holy Spirit needs to convert you. You need to repent, but you need to be brought to repentance. Satan does not have the mind of Christ. He does not have God's way of looking at things. He, he's lost that when he rebelled. But here's the grand speech. Who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, nor what the potent victory. And he speaks of God as if he were a big cosmic bully. You know, all he had was force. He had thunder and lightning and so forth. Okay, he's just got, so he has no moral legitimacy at all. He just has power. Whereas the, it's the other way around. Satan has no moral legitimacy. All he sought to do was to seek for and grasp power, and he didn't care about the means, and he didn't care about the consequences. He didn't care about his fellow angels. In fact, he didn't care about anyone but himself. But he's going to accuse God of all those things. The romantics take Satan's at his word and think that he is morally superior to God. Why? Because God wins. So they're going to stick with the loser. Anyway, but he says, Not what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict. Do I repent or change? Though changed in outward luster. So I'm, I'm changed on the outside, but inside, there's a lot of light here. It doesn't, I know it doesn't look that way, but I've got, I'm, I've got my mojo. I have everything that I always had. And even more so now because I've learned from experience. That's what effectively he's going to say. But what does he have that won't, I won't repent or change, though change in outward luster? That fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit that with the mightiest raised me to contend. So it's God's fault that I rebelled against him because he made me so glorious that I wanted to be even more glorious. And to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed that durst dislike his reign and me preferring his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne. All of this is a lie, by the way. There was a battle in heaven, but it was one third of the angels. The battle was never dubious. It was never in doubt. You can't win against the Almighty. <laughs> it's the definition of the Almighty. You can't win. Since he's also omniscient, he will know what's going on before you even conceive it. You, you, like, how can you be, defeat God? It's, it's absurd. Satan drinks his own Kool-Aid. 
and shook his throne. Well, we're going to find in book six when the account is told that he doesn't even get anywhere close to the throne, let alone shaking it. But here's the grand speech. What though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate, and courage never to submit or yield. And what is else not to be overcome? That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power, who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire. That were low indeed. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. Since by fate, the strength of gods in this imperial substance cannot fail. Since through experience of this great event in arms, not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile, eternal war irreconcilable to our grand foe, who now triumphs and in the excess of joy soul reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. So again, lies upon lies upon lies. He refers to, this, to, to the fate in reference to his creation. He no longer acknowledges himself as a creature of God. He says that it's fate that overruled these things. Now fate, I mentioned to you uh, when I taught the Greco-Roman epics, the fates were also gods that the um, the gods of um, uh, the, uh, the sky gods, uh, Zeus and others, had no power over. And I said that this is one of the, you know, if you want to see Jupiter or Zeus as the great gods, he's called the father of gods and men, and you want to compare him to the eternal god of the Christian faith, there is no comparison because he doesn't even have any control over the future. The fates do that, and the fates are blind. They just, there are three of them, they cut the cord, human life is it's measured a certain way, and, and Zeus can't change what's fated. It's his job to do what is fated. Here, Satan is appealing to the fates, which uh, orthodox understanding of God will utterly contradict. God is, remember Milton's own phrase, he's going to assert eternal providence. God sees all things. He provides for all things past, present, and future. Satan is suggesting he's not God at all. And he calls the God who is a gracious and just king, he's calling him a tyrant. So it's lie built upon lie. And the only reason that he does uh, hold to this narrative is simply because he wants to be the God. That's it. So therefore, it's unjust. It's unjust that I'm not God. That's his argument. And if, if I'm supposed to be God, then of course he's an illegitimate ruler. He's a tyrant. We, will sh we shall see by the fruits who is the just God and who is the false and who is the tyrant. It's clear from, to Milton, by the way, he's not trying to persuade us. He's trying to, to tell what Christian theology already tells. Right, this is not Milton's understanding of God, it's the Christian understanding of God. Satan is a tyrant. He's the prince of this world. All the tyrants and princes of this world uh, follow his path when they seek power and oppress their opponents. When they ignore justice, when they ignore compassion and mercy, when they reject grace, when they take human life, when they sacrifice the innocent. They're acting in Satan's, uh, with Satan's counsel. So spake the apostate angel, if you're wondering what Milton thinks about him, the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. And him thus answered soon his bold compeer, I'll skip over that, because I want to come to Satan's speech here. This is, uh, so Beelzebub answers, asks a question, and the archfiend replies to him, and this speech here is important. 
for identifying Milton's notion of heroism and how utterly incomprehensible it is to Satan. Here's the speech. Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. But of this be sure, to do aught good, it should be A-U-G-H-T, to do aught good never will be our task. To do any good never will be our task. But ever to do ill, our sole delight. Why? As being contrary to his high will whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labor must be to pervert that end. And out of good still to find means of evil, which oft times may succeed so as perhaps shall grieve him, if I fail not, and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim. Let me just stop there for a sec. So here is the, one of the great highlights of, that will demonstrate Milton's notion of heroism is how Mil, uh, Milton's Satan disparages his notion of Satan or of heroism, which is he regards weakness as purely miserable. Being a creature means being weak. You're dependent. You're not utterly self-reliant. He can't tolerate that. He cannot tolerate being a creature. He cannot tolerate being dependent. He cannot tolerate the fact that he is not God, and so he rejects it. He will not admit it even. To be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. Now, if we flip forward 10 books of this, we will get his notion of heroism presented to us, his being Milton's, which is Christ who became weak, who suffered naked, defenseless at the cross, in the hands of his enemies, betrayed by his friends, and did not account it to be a misery, but rather accounted it the way in which the power of God would be displayed because he was, after he was crucified and died, he rose from the dead because death could not hold one who was sinless. Right? But he sees that weakness as there's no power in that, there's no strength in that, there's no goodness in that at all. He sounds like Achilles, the wrath of Achilles. He could not be less than any man. He is, like, he is the model of pagan heroism, is Satan when he speaks. So when the Romantics said that Satan is Milton's hero, they clearly don't understand the gospel. They simply don't. They haven't understood the nature of Christian heroism. But here it's articulated in its antithesis to be weak as miserable doing or suffering. Not so. But from Satan's vantage point, this is deplorable, disgusting, everything wrong with this. But here he sounds like, again, the world's notion of heroism. As I said, indomitable. What do we admire about the great athletes? They go down and they get back up. You can beat them down, but they're going to get back up, and they're going to win in the end. Who doesn't admire that? I admire that. I, people who are, show the perseverance and character to get up when they're knocked down, very important in life, for sure. But is that alone going to, like an indomitable spirit, is that going to save you and bring you to eternal happiness? Not so. You will end up in the underworld. You'll end up dead, just like everybody else. You haven't taken a, a, a truthful account of who you are in relation to God. But he sees the problem here, and now he mentions his providence. He knows about God's providence. Well, what, what is he like? Well, he's going to bring good out of evil. That's the problem here. And if he tries to do that, that will, we'll, we'll, we'll fix him. We'll make him... Okay, so he says all that. And so then he... And, and he noticed that God has pulled back the thunder and lightning which drove them down to hell to begin with. And he says, okay, we've got a little, a little pause here. Now we have a chance. Let's go back at him. And there's a little counsel in the underworld that goes on between Satan and the other devils about what they should do next. Moloch wants to run at him again. Let's go after them. Like a second time, let's charge. And the rest of them, mm, I don't think we want to do that. Like, like the, the full frontal assault, that didn't work very well the first time. And I think we're going to fail again. He doesn't care. We're going to go back at him. 
uh, Mammon wants to dig down into under the lake of fire to see if there's some like gold or other stuff like that. He wants like wealth. Maybe there's stuff dug you know under here which we can make us rich, rich. The underworld uh, in the pagans uh, conception was presided over by Pluto who is regarded as the richest of all the gods because he inherits everything. Right? God of death gets everything, all the riches that you can't take with them. Who gets those ultimately? Um, but a council comes forth uh, which they eventually uh, fall upon as better, which is they're going to try and pervert what God is doing. So not by violence, but rather through guile, through deceit, through lies, through trickery. That's the way forward. God created by his word, we will deceive by our words. We will mimic God's path in following a better path. So not direct hit. We will come about it in a roundabout way. And that's how we'll do it. And Satan likes this counsel and decides to follow it. And the counsel is one that he himself proposed and put a subordinate up to here. But he, he goes across, he's compared when he moves in uh, across the lake of fire to uh, uh, Titanian or Earthborn that warred on Jupiter, Briarius or Typhon, so ancient serpents, whom the den by ancient Tarsus held, or that sea beast Leviathan. So you can refer to pagan uh, precedent, you can refer to biblical precedent. Either of those will do. A and what he, oh, this is an epic simile. So I talk about epic diction. We have a long extended simile. Now what does Milton do in his epic similes? He tends to do what, uh, he tends to compare his figures here with all sorts of uh, precedents that are like this and compiles them together to create a new image. So here he's being compared to uh, a, in bulk, as huge as whom, the as whom here is the simile. A simile is a, a comparison using like or as. So he's being compared to the great beasts of, that man, are mentioned in the classical world uh, in mythology or in biblical epics. In this case, Leviathan, mentioned in Job, right? The sea beast. Uh, and he goes onwards and onwards and onwards and and he's allowed to move. And this is the important thing about providence. What happens here? He, had, he would never have been able to leave the lake of fire, had not risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark design. So God lets Satan off the floor of the lake of fire. How come? Does he not know what's about to happen? What is about to happen? Well, he's about to go up and pervert mankind. That's going to be his intention. Does God not foresee this? He does foresee it. And he lets him go. He lets him choose to go down this course. Now, this is Milton presenting Christian theology. God sees what is about to, he sees the fall, foresees the fall. I'll deal with this when we come to book three, next class. God sees what's going to happen and he allows it to happen. Is he responsible for it? Well, we'll see Milton's response, or Milton's God's response to this. He's going to say, in response to that, that he's not responsible for the actions of those that even oppose him. They have free will to do these things until they enslave themselves. And in this case, he's going to bring out good out of evil. Uh, Milton Satan has just said this. He's going to bring good out of evil itself. That's his path. But he left him to his own dark designs that with reiterated that with reiterated crimes he may heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace and mercy shown on man by him seduced, brought on himself treble confusion. So Milton's already given away the whole story, which is that God is going to allow him to succeed in perverting mankind, but God is going to show mankind grace, and it's, he's going to fail even though he succeeds. 
right? So Milton's audience knows the gospel. They've heard the Christian story. He's not introducing anything new to them. Remember, he's writing in the 17th century. He's writing in English to Englishmen. They've heard these things before. Milton is not uh, creating a story that has not been told. He is expressing the truths of Christian theology in the story. Forthwith upright he rears from the pool his mighty stature on each hand, the flames driven backwards, up he goes and downwards. And then another speech. Is this the region? This the soil? The climb, said then the lost archangel. This the seat that we must change for heaven? This mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right. Farthest from him is best whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields where joy forever dwells. Hail horrors, hail infernal world, and thou, profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. And the famous words here, the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. What matter where if I be still the same in what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater. Here at last we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure and in my choice, to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore let we then, our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the ambulance pool. So Satan is, <laughs> Satan is giving these grand speeches. Meanwhile, his, his, his friends and comrades are lying face down in the water. And he said, oh yeah, oh, but why have we left them there? Oh yeah, okay, up you go. Doesn't care anyway. But note these phrases here. He claims that the mind is its own place. There's an internal world which God has not conquered. And as long as I, my mind is unconquered, I can think that I'm in heaven even though I'm in hell. And I can declare that what is heaven is hell because I have the capacity to imagine it. Satan is the great wielder of the human imagination. We can call good evil and evil good. That's what he's asserting here. Have you not heard that before in scripture? Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. This is Satan. He also says that it's better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. Again, articulating what I said about weakness there. He would rather be reign over the worst possible place and he will make play he will make earth by the way the worst possible place he can rather than serve in the courts of the almighty which would be far greater if he would just humble himself but not so so here's the mind of the satanic one it's the mind of the of the man of this world as well and it's it's juxtaposed but note here the mind is its own place and the idea of an internal geography it's going to be very important because we're going to lose paradise in this account of paradise lost. It's a physical place. They're going to be cast out of paradise. But the consolation that they will find is that there is a paradise within, happier far. It's better than what than the place, the physical location that you were thrown out. There is a paradise within, a spirit-filled consolation and knowledge of the presence of God, which you will uh, you have now as a foretaste but will one day see, uh, when you see God, you will see him face to face. That's the paradise within, even though you're no longer in paradise. But this idea of an inter, the mind being its own place and me being able to imagine and conceptualize, and if I think it so, it is so. I can imagine that I'm God even though I'm Satan in hell. I can, if I just think I'm God, then I'm gonna be God. He self-identifies as God. Think of the way in which this is used today. Self-identification. Satan is the first self-identifier, by the way, that follows this, this wretched path of saying he is something which is exactly the opposite of what he is.
clear lies. So he speaks and Beelzebub answers. They all decide uh, that they should pervert mankind. Two minutes. And then the question is, who's going to go do this? And they ask around and there's silence. No one wants to do it. And then Satan, who's been waiting for this moment, says, I'll do it. And they're all like, yay, cheers. Of course, we intended on doing it to begin with, but he sets up a council in which he's going to be nominated as the one who will do this, and then he goes up and does it. Now, I didn't get to book two. I'll do that next time. I'm going to do it around, if you want to do the reading in advance, uh, from around 550, book two, 550, on to 700 or thereabouts. And we'll see that he winds his way up from hell through chaos and comes to the gates of hell. And there he meets two figures. I'll talk about them next time. And once he gets beyond them, having created a sort of a, a, a covenant with them, he will then go uh, and will come to book three, which is, as I say, we go from hell to heaven. And Milton will invoke the muse again, and then we'll look at what Milton says about heaven and the characters that we see there. We'll see God the Father speaking to God the Son about what Satan is doing and planning to do. Yes? Absolutely. And Preface to Paradise Lost, which I mentioned last time. Uh, this, this book is profoundly influential on countless people. It, it, this is the, I, for me, this is the greatest work in the English language. And what's interesting about that is he is just using the account from Genesis as, as the base of the story, the sort of the kernel of the story. It's, it's scripture. But he fuses it with the great epic tradition and does it with the terrific language. By the way, remember, I, or I don't know if I remember, I don't even know if I told you, he doesn't write this, he dictates it, because when he, he writes this, he's blind. He dictates it to one of his daughters, and she writes it down. He's, he's doing it from memory. It's in his head, the words. In fact, he'll, I'll come to that next time when we look at the, the invocation of the muse. Uh, how this comes about. He will talk more about that specifically. But yes, I do think that it was influential on Lewis and, as I say, countless others. Anyway, I'll see you next time.